Good evening, everyone. I wanted to give a brief lecture for week two on spatial data models. Um, introduce what spatial data models are, talk a little bit about how we store position and location in spatial data models, how we store the descriptors of the spatial data models in, in terms of attributes, uh, the, the two core data models that we use, vector versus raster, and then I'll, I'll touch just briefly on on tin as a as a data model as a unique type. So a spatial data model is very similar to other database data models. The thing that makes it unique is that it stores location along with a set of attributes. And typically that location is stored as a set of coordinates. Uh, those co coordinates could be coordinate pairs or they could be uh, some sort of vector information that provides an offset to, to understand a location. Um, they're always in reference to a known location, um, an origin. Usually that's managed and stored in a projection or a coordinate system so that we can understand where these things are in reference to the real world. Now, once we know where they are, in order to know what they are, Right, we need to have a set of attributes that describe them. And those attributes could be discrete. Uh, so for instance, categories, is it lake, forest, meadow, city, um, or continuous? For instance, looking at the ocean, it might be salinity or water temperature measured at uh, regular intervals across the landscape. And these attributes, are associated with geographic features through a relationship, usually through a unique ID. So the geographic feature has a unique ID and the attributes have a unique ID and you marry them together. And some that times those relationships can be very complex so that I might have a table of attributes that relate to another table of attributes that then relate to a set of geographic features. And these are table relationships and we'll, we'll talk more in depth about table relationships later on in the course. Uh, along with the spatial data itself, there is actually the presentation of spatial data. So I might have a point line or polygon and I know its locations, but I have to decide what it's going to look like. And that's the cartographic data model or cartographic symbology. So for instance, I might have a point that represents the location of a house and I want to represent that as a symbol of a little a little house shaped symbol. Um, I might also have different representations for that house. I might represent the house as the boundary of its footprint and I want to make that a black line or I might represent the house as an area, a polygon and I'm going to make it white with a gray boundary or I might represent it as 3D vector data. So it's a 3D model that actually stands on the landscape and has doors and windows and you know a, a gabled style roof. The interesting thing there right is I have a single geographic feature, a home, but I can have multiple representations for it using different types of spatial data. And those can represent you know different useful models for different types of analysis but also a way of simplifying data or supporting multiple levels of detail, LODs. Um, and it may be that although the 3D representation of the building is more precise, for the purposes I'm interesting, interested in, I only need to connect the, collect the course location as a point on a map. There's a similar concept for rasters called pyramiding, where I might have a very, very detailed raster uh, but what I'll do is I'll create a generalized version where I aggregate multiple cells of a raster into one larger cell and do that at multiple levels. And that allows me to only display the level of detail I need, which improves display performance. So these are some more complex concepts. We'll, we'll talk more about them as we go through the course, a level of detail and pyramiding. Um, there's also integration between different types of spatial uh, spatial data. There are topographic and topologic relationships between spatial data. Um, so for instance, um, I might have two parcels that are side by side, 
they share an edge and those edges share nodes. And I have a topologic relationship between, built between these parcels. So when I edit the edge of one or edit a node on one, if it's adjacent, it edits the other one automatically. So that's a, that's a topologic relationship. I might also have a, a topologic relationship between the, the streams in a watershed. So the streams and rivers at the bottom are connected to the streams and uh, stream segments at the top uh, through an, an implicit topologic relationship where those streams flow down through the network system and contribute uh, to the bottom, so to speak, of the, of the river or watershed. And in some ways, these spatial data, uh, the spatial data integration, these relationships, these uh, topologic relationships, right, they can actually be forms of spatial analysis and inform us when we're working with GIS data. So a variety of things that, that GIS can represent, different ways of representing them. Typically, though, when we're working with GIS data, we aggregate it into a layer. Right, so a, a layer is a, a collection of like features, right, that stored usually in a common location. Some layers, though, are are global um, and have have coverage for the whole world. They they can the layer contains the of course the, the spatial information, the position and the attributes, but usually also the cartographic representation as well. Layers are often limited to points, lines, uh, and polygons. And sometimes 3D models in the, in the GIS world, those are called multi-patches. Uh, but not always. There are composite layers. Uh, in, in Esri world, for instance, we had the cart uh, cartographic representation layer, which could contain point lines and polygons all together in a single layer, stored in a single feature class um, with uh, explicitly stored cartographic representations on each feature. Uh, another example from the open source world is keyhole markup language, which was the language uh, built to be displayed by Google Earth, uh, where a single KML file can store all kinds of geometry, points, lines, polygons, and even draped rasters uh, all together in a single layer. Uh, the advantage of storing all like features in a single layer is that they may, if they all have a common data model, they all can share a single field and have a single table, and that performs very well. Whereas typically composite layers, you have variable descriptions for each feature. So if you're storing your forests alongside of your, um, I don't know, parking meter locations, right? You're going to want different attributes on those features. So either you're duplicating and creating unique features on uh, unique attributes on each feature, or you you wind up with a table that doesn't support the representation well. So a group of layers that cover the same spatial area, typically we, we call that as a project, you know, store them together as a project. In ArcGIS Pro, that's explicit. So we have an ArcGIS Pro project, which is a folder with a project file. Um, it tells you what uh, other folders are referenced, what other databases are referenced, what other spatial models are referenced, right? And you can wrap that up together into a project package and take it with you and other people can open it and, and work with it. Um, other GIS uh, technology doesn't ex have the explicit idea of a project, ArcMap, for instance. It's left on you to do a good job of managing your folders, putting all your data in the correct location. QGIS, likewise, uh, has that. And some, some software has very simple concepts of projects. City Engine, for example, just creates a folder named the project and then everything falls inside that folder and you just zip it up and, and share it that way. Variety of examples of spatial data, right? It could be uh, monitoring wells. Each well has a unique ID. It has a date when it was sampled. It has a concentration measurement. Um, the well ID might be unique, but there might be multiple entries for a single well because it might've been sampled at multiple dates uh, and have different concentrations. Um, so that you have uh, overlapping time series data. Um, so we, we'll, we'll talk about coordinates X, Y, and Z, which are spatial coordinates, but there's also what we call T or time position in, in, in the timeline and also M, which is uh, commonly used to store intensity.
Uh, it might be some sort of uh, polygonal data. So you're looking at the locations of different facilities and their addresses. The facilities and the addresses are, are unique um, and non-overlapping or, or some sort of uh, continuous data like the measure of occupancy and who occupies which units uh, across a city. One of the things to remember, though, is that the geographic data model is all about creating an analogy of some sort of real world phenomenon. Um, and it's, it's not mapping reality down to one one, but pulling out a piece of reality. Let's say an exi this example, streets, right? Mapping the locations of those streets and then having a, a set of attributes that, that properly describe that. And the, that set of attributes is called a data model. Um, so it's a structure for describing spatial data. And you build your own data models to describe geographic data, but there's a lot of also industry standards for data models available out there or examples that you can use to base your data model off of. And that's the structure of the database, the relational tables that stores the descriptive information that, you, that links to your location information. And ultimately, it's all boiled down into a digital representation that you can work on and collaborate on with other people um, to create meaningful representations of the world and do spatial analysis. And um, ultimately, the purpose of, of GIS is to support decision making. OK, let's talk about position, the different methods of representing geographic position or location as coordinates. You all remember back in your geometry days the Cartesian system, uh, the x and the y axis, and you got a, a set of pairs and you plotted those pairs on the in the Cartesian space and that gave you a location and then you could measure distance between those locations using math or or bearing or angle between those locations. This represents the core way that we store geographic information as coordinate pairs. Of course, if it's Z information as coordinate triplets, because you have X, Y, and Z. It's not the only way we store spatial information. There, there are relative positioning systems. Um, relative position to the center of the earth uh, is an example, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, or, or something like COGO, coordinate geometry, where you're measuring offset from surveyed locations. Uh, bearing and distance um, to create relationship between multiple spatial features and a lot of uh, cadaster information is managed and stored uh, that way. But I think probably the, the model most people are familiar with are, are, is a Cartesian system. And of course we have a Cartesian coordinate system for the world uh, in lat long. Divide the world up into degrees, uh, 180 degrees west, 180 degrees east, 90 degrees north, 90 degrees south uh, from an origin location. And in, in the world of lat long, that zero, zero, there is right off of uh, just west of, of Africa. So we can uh, say if we go a certain number of units, in this case degrees to the west, Right, a certain number of, or east, in this case, certain number of degrees to the east, certain number of degrees to the north, right? We have a point at 20 and 30, 20 in the x, 30 in the y, right? We can measure that along the grid, and we get a point at latitude north 30, longitude east 20. Very simple Cartesian coordinate system for managing and representing locations all around the world. Um, you might represent it uh, not uh, more precisely as degrees, minutes, seconds. So here we have a point that's north 16 degrees. There are 60 minutes in a degree, so it's 15 minutes to the north and zero seconds. And longitudinally, it's west 36 degrees. There are 60 minutes in a degree, so 32 minutes, so a little bit more than half a degree more to the west, and 24 seconds, uh, a little more than, a little less than half a minute to the west, um, to give us more uh, 
precise measures of, lo of those locations. And you could actually have decimal seconds at the, at the end as well to get more precise. Another way of representing that is actually decimal degrees. Um, so here's the same location, but we have converted it to decimal degrees. North 16.25 degrees, west 36.54 degrees. Uh, so we're going north of the origin and west of the origin. How did we do that? Um, well, let's take a little, little quick look here at how we can point a, a point in degrees, minutes, seconds to a point in decimal degrees. Um, of course, uh, there is one degree in every degree. So for, let's say we want to convert the longitude, west 36 degrees, 32 minutes, 24 seconds. 36 divided by 1 is 36 plus 32 minutes, and there are 60 minutes in each degree, so we divide by 60, and we come up with 0.533333, and there are 24, uh, there are 3,600 seconds in each degree, so we divide the 24 by 3,600, we add them all together, and we get 36.54 degrees in decimal degrees. And of course, you do the reverse if you want to convert back uh, into degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, of course, uh, the decimal degrees, the, the number of significant digits gives you more precision. Um, so you can more precisely map a specific location in the world. Um, the, if you don't have enough significant digits, you're going to, to wind up being less precise. Um, the other thing is, is it's not always referred to as northing or easting or westing or southing. Um, a lot of times it's positive and negative. So in this case, we're in the northern hemisphere. So the latitude is 16 degrees. That's a pod is positive value, 16.256, etc. But the long longitude, because we are to the west of the origin that runs through uh, Greenwich there, um, it's minus 36.5489. And if, if we think back to that Cartesian coordinate system that we worked with back in the geometry days, right, we remember the four quadrants, the top right one being positive, positive, top left, negative, positive, bottom left, negative, negative, and quadrant four being positive and negative. Uh, so you know the positional values uh, based on whether it's positive or negative and where it's going to be in the world. So just remember when you're talking lat long, latitude is the y, longitude is the x, and they're, they're reversed in the way we typically talk about coordinate pairs uh, when we're talking coordinate pair numbers. Uh, usually we put the x first and then the y. So here we have a, a point way down in quadrant three, right? Both negative numbers, minus 49.98, minus 62.32, and change. So, of course, degrees don't mean anything when it comes to elevation. Um, so elevation, we, we actually measure in, in a real world measurement system. So although the xy location of this point might be expressed as uh, decimal degrees, degrees, minutes, seconds, right? Whether it's below the ground or above the ground, that elevation is going to be represented in feet or meters or, or some other method. Um, and uh, that method is measuring down to some sort of uh, measured uh, reference, be it the mean sea level or min sea level or some abstract distance uh, to the ground. Now, with lat long, uh, of course, uh, we, are, we are having a lot of distortion, especially when it comes to measuring distances. If you're measuring north-south, right, uh, you're not going to, those measurements are going to be the same no matter where you measure on the globe. Um, the, the total number of degrees can be directly converted into real-world coordinates. Um, but if you're measuring east-west, right, uh, 
the, the number of degrees as you measure along the equator is going to represent more real world units than the number of degrees of, of a line that you measure south of Patagonia. Um, and that, of course, is because as you approach the top of the Earth, right, the distance that each degree represents diminishes. Right, so what is the length of a line at zero, measured at zero, east to west, right? Um, all the way at the top, and it, it has no length, right? Because it represents the North Pole. It is sort of the vanishing point of this Cartesian system, which is why we built projections. Projections give us a way to more accurately represent what's on the ground so that we can preserve either distance or direction or shape or area or some combination of all those. But there is no such thing as a perfect projection which preserves and everything. They're all a compromise. And we'll go into more detail about projections next week. Um, but generally when working with a, with a projected coordinate system, we're getting our point at real world coordinates. So here, this is a WGS World Mercator map, um, a historic map that's been uh, put into that projection. The point is at minus, uh, what is it there? Uh, 20 million and positive um, and minus 590,000. That's in meters. That's the distance in meters from the origin of this WGS 84 web Mercator map. But it's still a Cartesian system measured from the origin of, of that projection. There are projections that are cover smaller areas and they offer higher levels of precision for those specific areas. This is one of the state plane uh, projections in California, which is focused on Northern California and allows for more precise mapping in Northern California. However, uh, I did mention there's other ways of measuring location in reference to the Earth. Uh, for instance, you can put the center of the Earth at the center of X, Y, and Z and just measure a distance to any place on the Earth's surface. And that Earth's surface could be represented by a, a simple sphere or some sort of spheroid uh, or other more complex forms that more accurately represent the way the, way the Earth is shaped. Right. And just by changing, changing X, Y, Z, right, we get a different point uh, on the Earth. So here I've just uh, stripped away the uh, exterior of the, of the Earth, and we can see the X, Y uh, lines running through the center and our, our reference point there. You can sort of get a sense of, of how in, in Cartesian space from the center of the Earth here, where those two red lines cross, you might create a, an XY coordinate to, to either a position on the Earth or above the Earth or below the Earth um, to create these, these kinds of representations. Uh, another the way I mentioned is a, a referential system. So again, here's the center of the Earth. Um, but what we've done here is measured out in radians, uh, which are a, a type of measurement of angle and a distance. And that gives us our position. Uh, relative to the to the center of the Earth um, in our coordinate space, so variety of ways to to measure geographic position. Once you have position, uh, then you actually need to describe the spatial data, and we do that with attributes. It's a non-spatial data that is associated with a location that is descriptive. Um, typically, it's uh, words or numbers. It's providing a qualitative uh, descriptive uh, role. So it could be a name, uh, like a person's name who owns a property, a description, like a category of a, of a species that lives there, or maybe it's an associated label that helps the user understand what's at that location. It could be a, a code, uh, for instance, in zoning world it could be r1 for residential one single family home uh, that represents a, a certain class or category um, 
right? Or it could simply be presence or absence of a single feature or category, like a, like a Boolean. Um, typically, uh, these qualitative, descriptive uh, attributes, you, you can't really do any statistical analysis on them. They don't have any meaning in that regard. Um, or they could be quantitative attributes. So that she could be no numbers that represent a measurement at a specific location um, or a ratio with relative values where you can compare between the different, different uh, objects. Um, they could be uh, uh, features or categories, but features or categories that do have relative importance be between each other. And on those, you can do statistical analysis. So... For instance, you might have a, a qualitative description um, of the suitability of a landscape, high, medium, low, represented by a set of numbers, one, two, and three. Uh, but the, the, the high, uh, high suitability is not three times as suitable as the low suitability, so you can't really use them in statistical analysis. Or they could be unique identifiers, you know, locations, Mill Valley, San Francisco, Albany, Alameda, um, uh, that, that are that are providing you know very discrete descriptions, uh, or they could be measurements, um, property values worth a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, and you actually these these things often are in a data model are blended together, where you have a, a unique identifier, a qualitative description like a location that's combined with a quantitative description uh, like a population uh, to tell you something about a specific location. So they're stored typically using the basic data types in the database. So integer values, whole numbers, um, might be single double precision numbers uh, with uh, decimal places for more precise measurements or a floating place uh, number uh, with a, an undefined number of, uh, of uh, significant digits. It could be a Boolean value, sort of giving you a presence or absence, a yes, no, and off, on. Um, a string storing a name or a description um, or a specialized type of string such as a date which gives you a time reference and then there are other sort of uh, less used uh, data types like blobs binary long objects which might store associated uh, uh, items so for instance I might have a set of points which is uh, surveys. Each survey has a unique ID. It has a date that it was taken, and in its binary long object, it has a picture from a camera of the survey site. That's what you would use a blob for. Uh, there's a linkage between these attributes and the spatial data. Usually it's a unique ID or a, a composite ID uh, that, that combines these two things together. Um, and this is really the power of, of geospatial data, right? Is that when, when linked together, you can query by location, you know, does what I'm seeking intersect or does it contain or is it within a certain distance of a geographic location? And then see the, the attributes associated with the features who, that, that uh, meet those criteria and do statistics and do analysis on those features or doing it the other way around. You can query by attributes and say, give me all the locations that exceed a certain amount of, of property value as a way of, of discovering specific locations in a map. And that's really the power of linking of, of attributes to spatial data. Now that we have position and attributes, let's talk about the different spatial data formats uh, that we typically use to support uh, story of spatial information, uh, the vector data model and the raster data model. Let's start with the vector. Uh, so the vector data model generally contains uh, simplified representations of real world phenomenon. Uh, it consists of points, lines, areas, uh, but also surfaces and, and volumes that can be stored as vector data. It's stored in that uh, usually Cartesian space with the x-axis and the y-axis um, as a collection of coordinates, either a, a single coordinate uh, for a point or multiple coordinates representing a multipoint, uh, a series of coordinates in, a, in order to represent uh, a line, um, a series of coordinates uh, that 
eventually self-intersects to represent an area, a series of coordinates um, in 3D space uh, that represent parts or triangles in a surface, um, or uh, again, a series of coordinates that represent multiple surfaces that close to create a volume. Uh, the core data model for vector developed out of cartography and surveying this need to, to capture location information. Um, the space and features are defined by XY or XYZ uh, coordinates. Uh, occasionally you'll see variations XYZ, so 3D plus T for time or XYZ plus M, M for intensity or some other measurement or sometimes uh, all five. Uh, but typically, it's a uh, coordinate pair XY or a coordinate triplet XYZ. Um, it implies inherent precision of the location, and it's, it's assuming mathematical exact, exactness. Um, so that is the correct location of the feature. That is the correct location of the boundary, uh, be it the align boundary or the boundary of a polygon. Um, it may not be in the correct location, but the mathematics implies precision. Uh, and, and the level of precision is really only limited by the number of bits used to store the, the location information. Um, and the, the more, more bits used, uh, the greater the, the level of precision, although it's, there's n you know, never a reason to store precision beyond what you need for your analysis or to, to solve your problem. Um, and the nice thing about vectors, because you're creating a very discrete object, right? You can create precise calculations of length or distance between objects or area or total surface area or, to or total volume um, based on the data model. Uh, it's problems. Uh, not all space and features in space are precise. Some of them have have fuzzy boundaries and you're making a judgment call on dividing between them uh, to decide where things go. Uh, and that that can be challenging, uh, especially when you know you, you have to consider very carefully the scale that you need to map. Um, you know the, the more the more the larger the scale, the more precisely you'll capture the boundary, but uh, you have to do that consistently uh, as you work across uh, the landscape. And mistakes can be made when measuring this precisely. And, and, and you know, one of the things that is a common problem is, is that the, this precision or this assumed precision can be misleading and make people assume that the, the model is correct. Um, some examples of points, right? Uh, motor vehicle crashes, health facilities, septic tanks, um, earthquake locations. Um, examples of lines, you know, street center lines are an example, but it could also be the edges of streets, uh, subsurface gas lines, um, uh, flight paths of airplanes as they move through the air, um, the, the path of a hurricane as it takes as it moves across the landscape, just some examples of, of linear features. Um, polygons, you know, political boundaries, states, counties. Voting districts, um, you know, generated service areas for hospitals or or police coverage areas, uh, areas of aggregation like census tracts for demogra demographic information rolled up. And these are all stored in in vector data models. Uh, the the point objects in the vector data model, right? It's a zero D object. It's a usually a single coordinate pair, sometimes a triplet if it's a if it's three D. Um, or could uh, that zero D object could represent a single location of vertex uh, along a line when you're constructing uh, a line, um, in which case it, it likely has no attribution. Whereas uh, if it's representing a, a specific thing as, as a, a point in and of itself, uh, usually there's, there's descriptive attributes with it. Or it could be a, a, a node or a point uh, does, does designating the start or end of a line object rather than just simply a vertex, which is a uh, uh, a point between the, the start and end of a linear feature. Um, so, and again, remember, point objects alone, they may, they may have attribution. Uh, 
there is a there is a very specific type of of point object called a multi point, um, where you have a single record for the attribution, uh, but you have a collection of many geographic locations, many points associated with that single record. Um, but that's a very unique kind of point. You see it commonly in in incensed data where they're they're not doing discrete data. Um, no, sorry, not doing continuous data, but discrete data. And they want to make the data set small. They have the discrete value associated with multiple points. And that's a multi-point. Line objects, it's a 1D object, a line, a vector. Um, it's composed of two or more of these 0D objects. You know, if it's if it's uh, just two, right, then you get a single line. If it's uh, multiples changed together, right, then you have a set of segments that form a string. Um, which give you that more complex polyline object. It could be that the the distance between the, the two zero D objects, the two points, is straight, or it could be described uh, mathematically as some sort of curve. Um, so you could get a curved curved segment between the two points. Um, it might be a link uh, between two objects uh, that represents their, there's some sort of connection between them or it could be a directional link um, where one object is associated with another or it could be uh, like a string but with direction so that implying that the things move in that direction an, an example examples of directed link or a chain linked uh, directional objects are things like uh, transportation networks that are one one way or stream networks that are flow downhill uh, so there is an implied from to associated with the linear object and then area objects right uh, 2d objects areas or polygons are combinations of strings uh, that close and create a boundary um, and create a totally closed loop um, and that represents an area and from that, you can, of course, uh, get the circumference by measuring all the segments and then an area through mathematics to know that the area is, is covered, uh, covered within that polygon. And polygons can be very simple, um, you know, compose a chain of multiple strings, lines or segments, curved or straight, uh, that define an area, uh, or they can be complex. They can contain, contain islands or rings or holes inside of them that are exclusion areas, or they may be multiple geometries, multiple polygons, um, side by side, but they share a single attribute, similar to a multipoint. It's called a multi-part polygon, um, where the polygons sort of spread uh, more distributed uh, along the area. Uh, so just something to, to remember that, that you might encounter. The raster model of storing spatial data was, was really started when scientists started looking at measuring the landscape uh, continuously and realized that there, in some cases, there were no boundaries. There was nothing discrete there to measure. Elevation is, of course, the most obvious example. As you move from cell to cell, it changes continuously and evenly as you do it. And if you do some imagery capture, some remote sensing, you'll see that the color values, the RGB values that you're capturing in that remote sensing also change continuously. And there are many spatial phenomena, temperature, uh, snowfall, rainfall, right, which all make sense as uh, represented as continuous values. And artificially splitting those into discrete objects like a vector, um, right, gives that that false sense of precision, false sense that there is somewhere a magic dividing line where it leaps uh, from one value to the other. Um, so the raster format was invented as an idea of you know creating a gridded representation of the landscape, and each cell or pixel in the grid is given a value, and and that value means something, be it a be it a measured attribute like temperature, or it can still uh, represent discrete features um, by having discrete values in each cell. So uh, 
when we, we think about raster and the raster data model, really, there's, there's two ways to, to conceptualize it, right? Continuous data like elevation we see on the left, um, where you have many fractional values and you're measuring a, 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 usually a, a single variable um, and, and doing it continuously across the landscape, or discrete raster uh, on the right, right? We actually have a, a classified version of aerial imagery breaking up the landscape into discrete parts, agricultural land, forest, meadow, um, urban, uh, and housing um, that represent really defined uh, and discrete things that you're measuring on the ground. The raster model, right, the grid covers the entire map. It's space filling, whereas in the vector model, uh, oftentimes with polygons, you'll have polygons that are floating in space and they have nothing around them or nothing touching them. Um, each pixel is representing a square of the Earth's surface. Um, the location is actually not stored in that cell as an XY. The cell has an implied location and there's the whole grid of all those cells. One quarter of the grid is geographically referenced to a, a real location in the world. And then the size of the grids in X and Y, and there is such a thing as called a voxel where you do can have cells that are in Z as well. But the size and number of those cells implies the offset from that origin. Um, and that's how you find location. So cell location, the grid origin refers to the center of the cell. Uh, so the precision is based on the size of the cell or the resolution. And of course, how precisely that original origin location of the of the raster was positioned. So discrete rasters, right, refer to rasters with classes, limited numbers, usually they're integer values. Uh, pictures with the same value represent the same class. Um, they're very similar to polygons, except um, you don't, you know, you have a, always a square edge or or a sort of a simplified representation of edge because you can only have a, a, a you know, you can't have angled uh, edges when you're dealing with a raster. Um, commonly used soil classification, vegetation classification, a lot of times for a thing derived from sampled sources or sensed sources. Um, there is the possibility of having multiple attributes um, per cell. Um, so you can, for instance, store a soil class and vegetation class in one raster on, on different what's called bands and then flip between the bands to see the, the different data that you're storing there. Continuous rasters, right, have an unlimited number of values. Typically, they're floating point. Um, each cell is unique. It has, there's no classes, so they don't belong to a common grouping. Um, but they might actually share the same values. You might have two places with the same elevation, um, but they, they are not part of the same class, uh, so to speak. Um, it's not equivalent to polygons. There, there's there's uh, really not a, an analog in polygons for, for continuous data. Um, you also hear raster models called a surface. Um, fundamentally, you can treat them all as, as surfaces. And there's some great examples are elevation, temperature, salinity. And you can classify rasters in a variety of ways. And, and we'll go through those, those as we go through the course. Um, you know, equal interval, uh, uh, quantile, et cetera. There's just different ways of categorizing them, especially for cartographic and display purposes. So when we're, we're thinking about raster versus vector, you know, what, and here's two examples on the left is these are the same data they're both discrete data they're both landscape data telling us something about the about the, the landscape um and we can compare them side by side and we can immediately see see the you know some some fundamental differences right the, the one on the left gives us a more precise representation of 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 the boundaries between things right the raster on the right is is a, a coarse representation because it can't follow the exact boundary. Um, but if this is, for instance, interpreted data, um, right, we can't be guaranteed that the precision of the raster of the vector is correct. Um, and so perhaps the generalization of the raster is good enough. 
Um, typically, vector data takes up less space on disk. It's more efficient in, in that regard. Um, so it doesn't eat as much storage, whereas with raster data, if you imagine that, that lighter green area, you're storing a value for every one of those cells, um, whereas in the lighter green area on the left, you're storing a single value just for that polygon. Um, so you know your, the raster data is going to be larger on disk. Um, but when it comes to geoprocessing and spatial analysis, when you're comparing vector to vector data, right, there is a, a bunch of very intense uh, geometry and intersection happening to compare polygons of unlike shapes together. Um, so that geoprocessing becomes an analysis becomes slower on vector data when, when you're comparing um, uh, data sets with different boundaries. Whereas with the raster data, when you're doing the geoprocessing, you're comparing cell to cell. And so you're just comparing one value to another and it's very quick. Um, you may have a large volume of cells, but, but since there's no actual um, uh, collision and intersection of geometry, it's, it's much quicker in that regard. Uh, so rasters are, 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 are much better for continuous data. Um, they do a better job of representing spatial variability. They're really good for data derived from remote sensing. We're just storing remote sensing data in general. Um, so you're going to typically see, you know, uh, all, all the interpreted data from imagery into, into landscape classifications probably stick around and stay in raster, not be converted to vector. Vector is best with the, with the defined boundaries, political boundaries, human-made things. Um, sometimes, you know, interpreted things can be represented that way. So, for instance, you could do vegetation boundaries. If it's human interpretation, like, for instance, human ground survey, then, um, you know, someone's doing a set of linear surveys and generating polygons from those, uh, that you'll see polygon representations of that. Um, often you'll see raster interpretations of watersheds and hydrology converted into vector uh, because they're just more efficient and they and they can accurately represent the ridge lines and the divisions between watersheds um, vector data is required for certain certain types of of workflows in gis uh, network analysis is all done through vector um, you know building a transportation network building a water network building a water utility network Right, that's all built on top of linear vector uh, data. Um, topology, uh, the relationship between, you know, a point must, uh, must be inside of a polygon. The edges must lie on the perimeter of a polygon. All these topologic relationships between features uh, require vector, vector data model. And vector does make crisper graphic output. I mean, you, most of the maps you see in National Geographic are, all, are based on creating vector data usually laid on top of a raster generated from elevation for topography or some imagery that's sensed. But the features that they're showing, the information they're conveying is, is most often uh, vector data. There is sort of this, this middle ground, this, this odd duck data model. It's called a TIN, triangulated irregular network. It represents a surface, and it represents a surface, a continuous surface, as a collection of vector data, a collection of triangles. Uh, it's mainly used for terrain modeling, but not exclusively. Um, and it has some advantages. Um, one is, is it can store a very precise representation of a surface, um, for instance, an elevation surface, um, by choosing where to simplify and where to be complex on portions of the landscape that are uniform, let's say a large area of even slope, that can be generalized into a very small number of triangles. And then you don't have to store a large number of cells, for instance, in a raster to represent that. But an area of high variability, right, you can have many triangles and more dense triangles to get a higher level of fidelity. Um, so you have more control over the generalization of, of how a surface is represented. And so there is, there is a, a, a vector-ish tri triangle model, and, and there's a lot of tools that convert back and forth between rasters and tins, and tins and rasters. And there are very complex models of terrain, uh, for instance, elevation data sets, which have combinations of rasters and vectors 
participating together in an order of priority to create a multi-resolution tin uh, to give you a very precise representation of elevation. So that's just another data model to, to be aware of. So this hopefully helped uh, illuminate a little bit more of, of what you're reading in, in the Bolstad uh, this week. If you have questions, please uh, post them to the discussion forum, and I'd be happy to answer them, and I will see you all Wednesday.